Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining Marianne and the professor. Uh, we have an unusual situation today. Uh, the professor that I'm going to be interviewing is in a very remote place and is having issues with his camera. So we're going to have to listen to him as opposed to watch him. Um, so I want to introduce Dr. Simon Michaud. Um, Dr. Simon Michaud is a, a professor of metallurgy at the University in Helsinki in Finland. And he's a professor of... Um, metallurgy, geometallurgy, and metal processing. Um, so Simon, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hello, Marianne, and thank you for being patient. So a little bit of a glitch this morning, but I thought we should proceed because I think your message is important for people to hear, especially on the heels of the World Economic Forum meetings, um, currently yeah. in Davos, where they're plotting and scheming as to how we uh, move into the next era of green technology and as they plot our future, um, I think what you have to say is particularly interesting. Yes, so it's like I did um, put together some work that is very simple using maths I learned when I was 13. It's not that complicated. Um, and what I've essentially done is I've, I've published a series of reports to communicate something I've been seeing for some years now. Uh, there was no credible uh, feasibility plan for macro scale industrial reform, either to deal with peak oil or to phase out fossil fuels and, and have a replacement system. Like none of it existed. And so there were the, these, there was lots of vague platitudes. And so all, all I did was pose the basic hypothesis if we were to phase, uh, completely change the system that's around us now, take it from a fossil fuel-based system and into a non-fossil-based system, based on the technology that's been promoted, what would that look like? And the second question was, how much metal will we need to do that, and of what kinds? And can mining deliver it, or even recycling for that matter? And the simple answer is, the problem's much larger than we thought it was, much, much larger, uh, to the point where we certainly don't have the time or the money to do it in the time we've allowed ourselves left. And even if we were able to do it, there's not enough minerals in the ground to deliver the needed volumes of metal. And as most of the system is still fossil fuel based, we can't recycle something that hasn't been constructed yet. So we've got a series of overlapping problems. So Dr. Simon Michaud, can you run through, when I uh, saw your thousand page report and saw a list of the metals that are required for green technology, such as copper, lithium, cobalt, can you run through the years of production required for each of these to meet the 2019 levels? Or maybe you can describe that and run through the numbers because I okay. was horrified when I read this because I thought this is relatively simple math that seems to have eluded the elite in their, yeah. um, you know, their fantasies of, of the direction that we are to be headed with the green technologies. I'm, I'm a about whether it's a fantasy or not, I, I think I, I think they know exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so the numbers that I've actually put together. Uh, uh, you could, um, everything at the moment is focused on what we call lithium ion based chemistry for batteries. And, and you could argue we can make batteries as something else. But if we're going to electrify everything, we're going to need a lot of copper. So let's look at copper. Now, the world production in 2019, and 2019 is the last year before the COVID pandemic hit. So it's the last sensible year of data. We had uh, the, the global mining industry produced 24 uh, million. 200,000 tons of copper brought to the market. Right. Now, if we were to electrify everything, turn, uh, uh, replace all the vehicles around you, some of them are electric vehicles, some of the hydrogen fuel cells, if we were to phase out oil, gas and coal, electrical power generation, and in its place put in solar panels and wind turbines and hydropower and nuclear power and geothermal power, according to the split that the International Energy Agency says, right, uh, and if we were to phase out gas heating of buildings and have a green alternative, which is essentially, in this case, electrical heating. So if we did all that, we need a whole stack of metals. Now, for copper, 
we need 4,730,443,227 tonnes of copper. Now, that's assuming a 28-day buffer for wind and solar power uh, generation, which is highly intermittent, and that's to get us through seasonal variation. And that's probably too small. So hang on. So we need 4.7 billion tonnes of copper. We are producing 24 million tonnes of copper a year when things are good. Now, at current mining rates, we would have to mine for 195 years to hit that target. Okay, so this is exactly, uh, Dr. Misho, this is the report that I saw the highlights of. So 189 years of copper production required yeah. now to meet some of these requirements. And it gets worse. Lithium, it, it was 9,920 years of lithium yes. production and cobalt, 1,733 years. And I thought, numbers, okay, th this is so absurd. These numbers are massive. And I, I mean, my first question is, have the elite not seen these numbers? Have they not crunched the numbers? It's rather important to start looking at whether or not you have capacity before you try to convert the whole world over to electric batteries. And, uh, and the, the most simple exercise seems to have escaped them. Am yeah, I missing uh, something or uh, maybe clarify? What in the world are they thinking? Right. So let's finish the sequence so we understand the true uh, nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I think the people I presented to have been caught flat footed, mm -hmm. um, but they're not the people in charge. So, all right. So 195 years of current production. Mm -hmm. So then, then, then the simple answer becomes, oh, well, it's just a simple matter of just opening more mines, isn't it? Right. And so, well, then we go to reserves, current copper reserves 880 million tons but we need 4.7 billion tons so current reported global reserves as of you know for the u.s geological survey in 2022 right the amount of reserves we have on the ground is 18.6 percent of what we need to replace what's around us now with the understanding that it all wears out in 10 20 years and we've got to do it all again somehow so they're reserves so then people would say well, hang on, if the price goes up, then a lot of resources get reclassified as reserves. A reserve is a mineralized deposit that's extractable at an economic value in the current marketplace with the existing technology. If the price goes up, we can go to resources. And a resource is simply a mineralized patch of rock. A lot of the resources are too deep for us to mine and they're too low grade for us to mine with current technology. So a resource is not uh, something that's just, you, you can't guarantee a resource can be extracted. But right. let's say all resources were available. And they go, oh, right, well, current copper resources, let's find that, estimated global resource for copper is 2.1 billion, right? Mm -hmm. So we want 4.7 billion tonnes. So all the resources are only 44% of what we need. And, and then that's they'll- a, uh, And that's assuming they're fully extracted. Yeah, so, which is, so which is what, not possible. So what, what is it that there's such an illogical- um, It's never occurred to them. So the it, final, how final could step- they, How could this not occur to them though? They, I mean, they're, the whole premise of what they're trying to do is convert us from hydrocarbons to green technology but have they not looked at the capacity and the, the, the requirements to get us there before the they, shut, uh, they shut everyone off oil and gas? So the simple, I, simple answer to that is it's, uh, there, uh, it's an ideology on the surface and they never did the numbers because I don't think they never intended to do this for 8 billion people. Right. Oh dear. Uh, oh, that. Okay. Just a minute. So you're saying they never intended to do this for 8 billion. I don't, so there, I don't may be, there may be crunching their numbers for a world that has their ideal of half a billion or what, what do you think? So I, I can't, I can't prove here? that. I, mm -hmm. I can't prove that. So, so to finish that sequence, what mm -hmm. people then say, okay, well, well, we can't take the land resources. Let's mine under the sea. And there are lots of resources under the sea that we know of. But so in the um, undersea polymetallic nodules on the seafloor that we found so far, 
right, there is 226 million tons of copper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we want 4.7 billion tons, that's about 4.8% of what we need. So undersea won't do it either. So to, to sum up, reserves, resources, and under the sea resources, even if we sum them all together, is not enough for the first generation of what you see around us now. So, so what, I mean, these people are not simple. I'm assuming they're, they're clever. They're what, clever, but has, they're... what has possessed them to push the whole world towards this absurd goal, which is completely impossible? So it's, I believe it's an ideology. For the last 50 mm -hmm. years, we've been operating in a function of a term where uh, a series of ideologies that are not necessarily grounded in um, reality. Like if we want to balance their budget, we just print more money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in the current environment in particular, if something is not not something not to our liking, we can simply choose not to look at it. So right? if, they get, if they get challenged then from a professional like you, I mean, you're probably in the world, one of the biggest experts in this industry. If they get challenged, what do they say? Because you've so, been at some big meetings where you confronted them. What's their answer? Yeah. Do so they I just... Presented yeah they freeze they freeze three things so i presented 91 times last year uh several times you know at, uh, you know groups like the united nations and the mm -hmm. uh, international monetary fund and mm -hmm. uh, multiple government institutions in multiple countries uh multiple um universities uh the information's gone out on twitter everyone i present to in person accept the information and like it the people who criticize my work do so on twitter while flinging poo hmm. right so that, that that's that unfortunately is the nature of it so, so they don't things. object in person to you that's correct but then on twitter they get busy and try to discount what you said yeah yeah but so, it, face to face no one bothers to dispute what you're saying i guess it's so scientific how can you dispute it they don't have the numbers no. that's the problem no. i've got numbers and they don't so yeah. so three outcomes in all cases last year, every single one of them, not um, everyone was shocked. They were completely unprepared. That's point one. Point two, they were not able to refute what I was able to present mm -hmm. like, at all mm -hmm. because I was using their data to do it. They had no alternative. Mm -hmm. And point three, every single one of them asked, what do we do? They were asking me what to do. And what was interesting is I was able to think about that. And I'm actually writing a document now of what might we be able to do in the face of this. Right. And so we're talking about a massive reordering of society and a contraction. But what will that look like? What will that industry actually look like? And there are some boundary conditions based on what I've been looking at. And so what I think has happened here is in the beginning, uh, when this first started, maybe what? 15, 20 years ago, people were talking, okay, we're going to phase out fossil fuels, okay. Mm -hmm. And because fossil fuels were so ubiquitous anyway, they never really did it. Even in the last couple of years, all the money they put into putting up solar panel uh, systems, they've, they've put up quite a lot of effort. But what they've achieved is really only about, you know, 7 or 8% of primary energy. Right, and less than, and about one percent of the global vehicle fleet are electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they have barely scratched the surface of what has to happen. And because everyone still believes what they say is one thing, but what they do is something else, mm -hmm. and they've mm -hmm. never actually met the reality of it because we've always been able to fall back on fossil fuels, out of mind, out of sight. Mm -hmm. And so when they talk in these platitudes of everything will be fine and they propose a series of solutions none of those solutions were ever put in a situation where you could actually get to a macro scale feasibility study right if we were to fate if you were to shut down a single coal-fired power station in say in the region where you live what would they do to replace that power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that whole what conversation did not exist doesn't and and i think across europe of closing all the nuclear plants as they right. phase them out in germany and france etc and i think well these are very important conversations to have and i get the impression that a lot of countries are beginning to reassess whether or not they should have closed or decommissioned That's... their their you know their 
nuclear plants. And my sense is in a lot of countries in Europe, they are going to open them up again. And it makes sense. You, there is no good alternative right now. And you have two choices, let people freeze or, you know, especially in the middle of winter and not have sufficient oil and gas supplies or um, recommission, or I don't know what you call, but when you yeah. start up these plants again, same with the coal fired plants, there are no other options. So unfortunately, um, society has been put into a very desperate situation mm -hmm. where we're not given time to think about this at all. So uh, our thinking so far has been very ideological. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, as I understand it, what's happening in the German civil service at the moment is all plans for the future have now been reassessed. And there was a very, um, very strong internal conversation that was happening about which paradigm they should proceed with now. Mm -hmm. Should they open coal mines? Should they open, reopen nuclear power plants? Should they do a both? Or should they try and stick with the existing plan? Like, but the existing plan, all of those plans were seriously flawed because they weren't mm -hmm. thought through. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what seems to be happening is society is now being put into a very desperate situation where they're going to panic. And in a knee-jerk fashion, they'll, they'll uh, uh, do an ill-considered plan. And they're very susceptible to suggestion in that situation. Mm -hmm. And, so where, uh, what do you predict is going to happen then across Europe? Because uh, my sense yeah. is it's a desperate situation. I am getting an inkling, like you mentioned, in these convers in a lot of these countries, there is a conversation now. And I, uh, my suspicion is that they're looking at the UN and looking at all of these um, unrealistic goals that have been set. And there's, they're having a pause, which I take as a good sign. Someone's beginning to think at high levels here. Um, but what's your prediction as to how this is going to play out? So that's a very interesting question. Europe at large is, um, you could make the argument that we've made choices that are not in our best interests and, and we haven't thought them through. Um, and what the European leadership thought would happen has not happened. Like Their actions, for example, uh, uh, the current debacle with, with Russia, they thought, I believe, that it would be a more short-term problem. Mm -hmm. um, but now there's not a short-term problem. And now they've been, they've been committed to a course of action the moment someone blew up Nord, Nord 2 pipeline. Um, they're in a very difficult situation and there is no reason not to get them out of that uh, uh, situation. So you know how they have phrase, everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been punched in the face only to discover we don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, as to what will happen, I don't know, because there's a number of scenarios here. What I do believe is a lot of the current European leadership will struggle to maintain power. I could see them one by one being replaced. Uh, mm -hmm. As to how things will work out, I actually don't know, because it's the conflict that we've set ourselves up for is the diplomatic solution has been taken off the table uh, uh, now. And so um, and and it's largely through our, through you know Western actions that have done that. You know, uh, for, for example, a peace deal was on the table, but the uh, the British Prime Minister or the ex British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went into Ukraine and stopped that process. Mm -hmm. We don't want peace, is is that message? Uh, so it's it's like one side must win completely, and the other side must lose completely. And until then, until that is decided, and I don't think it'll be decided quick, we're in this situation of attrition. Mm -hmm. And so I can see a situation where lots are going wrong. Now, this year, uh, there was predicted, uh, uh, the long predicted food shortages and supply chain disruptions that we were thought were going to happen during COVID, but never really came through, might start coming through now. And if that happens, I would suggest all sorts of things will go wrong. And we'll just sort of see uh, uh, what we call the real economy will become very, very hard to to function. Uh, obviously, things are going to get rough. Uh, but in what sector? I think it's so volatile. It's mm -hmm. it's it's almost pointless speculating what would happen beyond it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Well, I look at your industry and um, energy as being kind of a core requirement for all economies. 
So if yes. you're cutting off supply of energy, you cause hyperinflation, which is exactly what they want, and you cause chaos, and you cause unemployment, and you cause you know, you know a tumbling of economies. So in a lot of ways, they're facilitating exactly what they, they want to see. And I just wonder at what point are people going to wake up and say, we have some real crazies running the show here who are so, psychopaths. Would you agree? Are these people normal? Um, so uh, I, I don't actually personally come in contact with the people who would make those judgment calls. Mm -hmm. I, I meet the people who you might call middle management. Mm. Now, the people around me all um, are appalled by what's happening. And when you talk to them, they would still claim this is all negligence or it's all an accident. There's no malfeasance really? at all. So they and give the benefit around, of the doubt to these crazies that this is they, all. They, well, we're we're yeah. conditioned not to challenge people. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the people around me absolutely believe that, that yeah, yeah, it, it, um, it's, it's all the actions of one madman, you know, the, the current Russian president, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin, it's all his fault. Mm. And so this is the narrative that everyone's going on, but everyone is quietly under the surface starting to do the math. Now, it's been apparent for a long time that um, these situations haven't just happened in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. they, they've happened over a period of time, and, and all the mistakes when you put them together follow fall of a pattern. All the mistakes go in one direction, mm -hmm. right? But it's not clear to any of the people, and I've talked to some fairly senior people, and not one of them, I believe, is the people with the hands on the strings and the levers. Mm -hmm. They're all sort of just sort of going along as part part of the system like everyone else. And, mm -hmm. You know, they, they have the idea that, you know, of, uh, of the super organism, the system, and that's the problem. Uh, but, the, but the idea that there is a... Uh, a, a, a group of uh, uh, really, really rich people who are interested, uh, who understand the situation uh, is coming for some time. Uh, what I believe happened was the Club of Rome report that was released in 1972. Everyone saw it, right? And I, I'm actually one of the people who actually used that report. But that, that report didn't just have the standard run, it had 12 simulations on top of that to try and avoid the calamity that's coming. And what they found was in all 12 simulations, you could delay the population crash, but you could not prevent it. That's what that study actually showed. Uh, current society is actually what's called the standard run, as if we do nothing, but it also validated the existence of that model. So I believe the people who were very, very wealthy, who do think in terms of intergenerational wealth, like they've been wealthy, you know, their family's been wealthy for decades, mm -hmm. right? That class of people. They understand that they've already got the money. They've already got the money, but they want power. How do they maintain power through a known situation that's coming? And how do they social engineer a situation where a small number of well-resourced people can hold a large number of people in place to accept crushing food shortages uh, and, and, and crushing ec um, economic austerity measures? Mm -hmm. Thus, this is the reason behind a lot of the police state stuff. It was the reason behind... A lot of what we might call the conspiracy theory stuff, look if it's come true. Like you know the the global um, the global cashless currency, mm -hmm. surveillance state. Mm -hmm. Even the idea of the chip in the arm is no longer that far away. Right. So mm -hmm. you know the, the, this endless cycle of wars that that that, that uh, are, are, are putting things out there is <laughs> one by one. Every single one of those theories that were so crazy when we first saw them, we're now sort of seeing them in mainstream news. The World Economic Forum, I believe, is the current front for this. Mm -hmm. Now, 10, 15 years ago, it was the Bilderberg Group and the Council on Foreign Relations who were the organizing force behind a lot of these policies. The World Economic Forum was not ever discussed. What I think is happening here is the World Economic Forum is being set up as almost like a, um, a sacrificial lamb, where they're going to roll out the plan, everyone's going to get really angry with them, right? And they'll be, then we'll find ourselves in a really, really difficult situation. And there'll be a backlash. There'll be a, a, a social backlash, and they'll make a show of taking down the World Economic Forum. And whatever the replacement is, is the best we can do in that circumstance. But that will be controlled. 
Do you, you think that, that could that be the UN or because the UN is really the uh, the creator of all of these agendas with the you know UN the 2030 so, uh, you know the all of these agendas at a core are UN agendas are they not Well that's the that's the way it was actually that that's where like agenda 21 came from that's mm -hmm. where codex mm -hmm. elementarius came from yeah and, and all the food stuff and, and it was all crazy in the beginning but we're actually see it happening now Mm -hmm. and uh, but um all of these groups are involved but but it, it, they, it they keep changing about which group they actually operate out of mm -hmm. uh, and now that we've got international tax uh, uh um even law they can operate out of anywhere and like a, a rich group can operate out of anywhere and you'd never know where right. you'd never be able to find who mm -hmm. uh and they, they would use the um a lot of these vehicles like um, if you actually sit down and read what the Great Reset actually says, you know, groups like Klaus Schwab and Klaus Schwab have actually written, mm -hmm. it's actually quite unnerving. But I think, uh, you know, you know you, you've seen the Internet's uh, censorship that's happened on the Internet over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's very telling about what things you are not allowed to say. But you are allowed to say terrible things about the World Economic Forum. That's not censored. And so I think the public are conditioned to be pointed at the WEF as these are the people who are responsible. So when they're taken out, uh, whatever it's replaced with are the good guys. Mm. And so humanity won't rebel. But now they say, oh, we're in a terrible situation, and now we have to make the hard decisions. Because it, it, the information, back to the information I've been collecting, uh, shows that no one has even started the practicalities of building a new system. Right. It's going to take 50, 60 years, mm -hmm. maybe 100 years. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't even been started. The planning hasn't even been started. And the, the simple, brutal uh, proposition, if, say, 13 out of 14 people dropped dead, a lot of the limits to growth issues and problems aren't problems anymore mm -hmm. and a lot of the yeah. infrastructure we have in the place at the moment doesn't need to be rebuilt because it will now suffice it, it's an eerie thought to think that these elite have factored that into the equation and perhaps that's ultimately what their goal is is to see see most um, of us eliminated and then we don't have a problem anymore we don't have so, a uh, an ecological or environmental issue anymore. Oh, that, it's that's very, one, it's, that's, it's that's very one vector. Mm -hmm. That's one vector. Another vector could be that they just simply used a distraction by keeping us distracted on a series of things that never actually went anywhere. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as long as we we're looking in the wrong direction, we would never put it together that it wasn't going to work. Well, I, th I think right. fundamentally, um, I come at a lot of these issues from a finance standpoint. And yeah. I view what is going on in the world as a financial coup. It's control, surveillance, and financial, absolutely uh, uh, so, decimating the world financial system, collapsing yeah. all of the all the fiat currencies, and moving into a completely different system, which mimics China. You know, with the central bank digital currency and everyone having a digital ID. I think that's the end game. Um, but I, in concert with all of these environmental issues, because I think the environmental component allows them to justify locking us down into these little 15 minute cities and not allowing us freedom of movement. So I think, so, so, do you have any comment on the 15? Yes, I'd cities? be careful, yeah. careful with that. That mm -hmm. makes sense on the surface. Mm -hmm. But from a game theory point of view, a lot of people are waking up and seeing it and they're seeing it faster than they, that, that that can be controlled easily. Mm -hmm. So what makes sense is to keep us looking at, you know, you know when the magician does the stage mm -hmm. trick, mm -hmm. one hand does something while the other hand distracts. Um, mm -hmm. Are we being shown a whole series of things to keep us distracted? So when the real plan comes out, which sits behind it, we don't even see coming. Mm -hmm. And So what I'm giving some thought about now is, okay, all this stuff there is now obvious. We've been looking at it for such a long time. And, and what is consistent is my cynicism of all, you know, of this, this, this world was validated. 
right? It, it really yeah. was, uh, it, it really is appalling. And so uh, um, we are looking at a system that's rolling, but what's, what's happening in our politics all over the world, we're encouraged to see two parties and we're polarized. You're either one party or the other. We're, mm -hmm. we're convinced to fight mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. As uh, yeah, and while we're doing that, we're never going to come together in large enough uh, numbers to initiate any real change. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of programming going on, and uh, social programming. And and so what makes sense to me is when the when the flashpoint comes, uh, all the things that we think are going to happen are the first round, and behind the first round, there's going to be something else. Uh, because a great deal of resources have been put into game theorying this mm -hmm. and all the people we think are responsible i believe are just ex um, expendable sock puppets mm. uh the, the 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 real people who are behind this we haven't even seen yet that makes sense to me with what i'm seeing and a lot of the analysts around me for example always focus on market price what is the market price of copper going to be or the market price of of steel or or cement and i point out to them that we've now got double digit inflation in many countries around the world and the rate of change suggests that hyperinflation isn't that far away and they all go very quiet very very quiet and so they say oh the world's all about money and it's a bit of money's not worth anything anymore what's it really all about then and if this is known and has been known for some time what's really going on here yeah well, I, and I think the future money is backing it with hard currency or hard assets, which in my mind are commodities like copper and gold yeah. and, and a basket of commodities, which I'm hearing some countries talk about um, implementing. That, that's the logical direction I think money that will go. Very logical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, um, I actually proposed that mm -hmm. um, in Finland. That we, we bring back the old Finnish currency and we back and what, it. what was was it well received this suggestion uh, a, a few, they all I, I didn't see any stressed people mm -hmm. everyone laughed no one challenged it but also no one also followed up on it yeah and so I think when you present something to a hostile audience or an audience that is nervous about something they collectively look at each other out of the corner of their eye to see who thinks this is a terrible idea and who likes it. Mm -hmm. And if they can see a single person who likes it, will we'll, we'll smile and, and give the body language, say, yes, this is real, this is good, a lot of people will go along with them. It's mm -hmm. like they're asking permission from the people around them mm -hmm. whether um, they're allowed to like something or not. This is how mob rule works. Yeah. but this like is, herd That's right. They're kind of the herd, herd mentality. Yeah. But I think it's a brilliant idea, but it certainly flies in the face of the globalists who would absolutely be against this i mean their nirvana is to have a digital currency with absolutely nothing backing it so um you know the digital currency with no hard asset behind it um allows them tremendous control you know yeah, well, if, if you're trying to back everything with hard assets that would put a massive kibosh and i guess that whole debate or the whole movement right now with the BRICS countries um you know, they seem to be leaning towards backing their currencies with hard assets. Yes, so that's it, it true. It feels there's as an... though there's a little bit of a uh, a war going on amongst the elites, right? So there's like a, um, I, I see a number of, it's, instead of, I, I like the idea of, of modeling the world like a horse race, mm -hmm. where each horse is a scenario. And instead of saying scenario A is what's going to happen, right? And then something happens to discredit it. Mm -hmm. Instead, you can say, oh, I will now look at 37 different scenarios. It's a horse race. Which horse makes it over the line first? Which horse won't mm -hmm. make it at all? What do I have to see before I can say each scenario is valid? And so we've got multiple chess matches happening. And one of them is, I think, uh, the BRICS nations, where I believe were formed in the first place, to um, get out from under the petrodollar alliance that has been in place since 1973. Mm -hmm. that, and that's why they formed. That's what's holding them. That's the glue that's holding them together. Right. And, and yeah. so, yes, Russia has made its move. And two days after it, 
uh, and we, we hit them with sanctions. We then uh, they come back and said, right, you now must pay for gas for rubles. They didn't cut the gas off. They said you will pay for it using our currency. And we told them that was unacceptable. Right. And so then they cut the gas off after a period of time had passed. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So that narrative is not quite how it's presented in the in, in the media. But uh, you may notice the United States has not committed resources to fighting Ukraine properly. Like you don't see any, for example, uh, airstrikes of carriers. Usually when America goes to war, you see a lot of airstrikes. Mm-hmm. Instead, they're sending in small uh, arms that, that, that can be shipped in and and. And weapons that, like, you know, obsolete tanks that they don't, that they no longer need anymore. Like, like, their actions tell something very different to what the media is suggesting, mm. right? Uh, so, because what I believe is happening is the moment they do, China will make their move on Taiwan. This is an opinion, right? Uh, and Taiwan is where the semiconductor industry is, and the Taiwanese control it with the Americans. But if China takes Taiwan, the Americans have lost control of the semiconductor industry. And then there are serious problems with that. Mm-hmm. So they're waiting for China to make their move. And both, and I think Russia and China are actually operating together. They do have a military alliance. Um, but, but whether it actually can be translated to physical action remains to be seen. Right. And, and so um, that's very interesting. Boy, I, I yeah. could speak all day. I know our time is very limited. I have one okay. last question. Uranium. I like uranium. I like nuclear power. It's clean. It's efficient. It seems as though the risks can be managed quite effectively. Um, it's. Th- tell me wh- what your thoughts are. Okay, I did a simulation on expanding the nuclear power plant fleet. Uh, and the simple answer is we can't build nuclear power plants fast enough mm-hmm. to expand them in size to actually generate enough electricity to phase out fossil fuels and replace you know, oil, gas, and coal. Mm-hmm. The other problem we have is we don't have the infrastructure to handle the stockpile of spent nuclear fuel. Uh, we can do other things, but we, we simply haven't done the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way the existing nuclear systems work, like uh, the current Gen 3 systems work, um, we're gen- it's, it's very expensive and it's tricky to actually make these assemblies. And, and the waste that comes out of it is, is highly radioactive and still full of energy. So it's like the whole nuclear industry is a research and development step to something else, like a more mm. effective version of nuclear mm. that, that actually does consume the uh, energy in each, in, in, uh, more effectively. And we don't have such a lot of waste uh, mm. in, involved. I like thorium. Uh, thorium is, is, uh, is very interesting. That has a very different waste profile. But um, to, to, to me, we haven't done enough research and development for it to be a, the primary energy source. And we certainly don't have the time to make these systems um, in the, in, in, to the scale that we need them. So if you were advising the powers that be how to proceed with energy, give me a one minute answer and then I'll let you go because I know we're, we're on okay. board time. But give me a one answer, one, one minute response as to how you would proceed with the current develop, energy develop crisis. A, develop a series of micro power grids around the existing fossil uh, uh, systems, use fossil fuels very carefully to build the next system, simplify everything, simplify our technology and develop regional capacity across the whole value chain, mining, smelting, manufacturing of components and then manufactured goods in a mm-hmm. 500 kilometer radius around mm-hmm. each node. We must simplify that, that. There's no choice in that. Very interesting. So everything, much more decentralized model. That's right. Interesting. Uh, You know, every time I think of solutions to our current dilemma, decentralization comes up in terms of power, um, in terms of, you know, the politics, decentralization, I think is always good. But this is very interesting, that model of decentralizing the power grid. And having having industry um, around those hubs where the energy is is available. Industry will move to where energy is. Energy Mm -hmm. will change its form. The mm-hmm. industry will change its form. People will move to where industry is, jobs, and food production will have to move where people are. So that chain yeah. reaction has to happen. Yeah. And then you go through the loop again of how much of this is actually possible mm-hmm. with the people that we have and the systems that we have. And you go around that loop in a Maslow hierarchy of needs uh, context. Very interesting. Very interesting. Do you have any other message that you would give the powers that be um, 
to start contemplating, not that they're interested, but for those of us who are interested, what would you, any other um, yes. interesting so, thoughts like that? Because that's very interesting. So we are conditioned to think um, we're screwed. The system's doomed. Mm -hmm. we're, con we're, 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 we're told the world is ending, but it's all over the world all at the same time. But it's non-linear. It's not going to be the same for everyone. There will be pockets of humanity right across the uh, planet who are not in the same situation as everyone else. And if they're smart, they can respond to this in a different way. Not everyone is going to see these problems, you know, the whole point of free will, right? And so the question is, what kind of world do you want to live in? Mm -hmm. And if it's up to you, and if you're in one of those pockets, what do you do? And how far would you go to create that situation? Or do you take on the narrative movie, in which case, sit down and drink some beer? So either you're defeatist in your approach, or you become very proactive. And That's correct. Industrious. But you must, but you've got to look at all the nasty stuff and not reject it. Just navigate around it. Navigate around it. So you would be of the mindset that we can navigate around all of this nonsense and create some of us a can. new. Some of us can. I like you, your message because um, I think that's what so many of us are trying to do is kind of create a new norm and a new kind of parallel society, not even parallel, just a new and better. So but, ask yourself the question, how many people around you now are prepared to look at any of this stuff? And then how do you think you're going to go on a problem you're not going to even look at? So the vast majority of people are going to panic and react. Mm -hmm. The people who can actually look at this sort of stuff have the luxury of thinking about, well, how would I actually do this? And where would I actually go to my, uh, about, uh, match up with like-minded people? Yes. The future yeah. is non-linear. It's not going to be the same. Well, and I, you know, the decentralized model that you're speaking of, if people were to step up, for those of us who have some clarity on this issue, were to step up and start developing businesses with this model in mind, and, it is a fundamental new, it, it's a new model it's a much better model it's a new social contract mm -hmm. we have to really think about like we either work together or we turn on each other right that, that, that that's the problem when there's not enough resources to go around right at the same time what does a global network in uh, give us and the answer is information what works mm -hmm. what does not mm -hmm. and then there also has to be more trust and transparency and better information, and the individual person has got to socially evolve to be much more competent. Because at the moment, we let a lot of our thinking be done by other people. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of complacency. And the next generation will have to be stronger than the generation that fought World War II. Right? And our current society has never been weaker. So see it as a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, we will rise to the occasion, and all the people we think won't be able to cope they will surprise you. We will rise to the occasion, but it won't necessarily be for everyone. But if you sort of see, well, I would look after me and mine. And, and anyone else who wants to uh, come with me and do the same thing, that's great. But those who are not interested, wave goodbye and go and do your own thing. And, and I think that's a really important point is that we can spend so much energy trying to pull along everyone with us. Yep. Or we can kind of forge a new reality with like-minded people and hope that we attract people to this new model. So I'm but, actually using biomimicry uh, of, of how a jungle or a forest would respond to an environmental change. The forest at large will stay intact. It might shrink a bit. The species involved will change, but the forest itself will remain. And that's what we're looking at. It, it's actually it, it, mm -hmm. it is a, a model that actually um, industry works with and economics can work with in a what's called an industrial ecological system. Mm -hmm. uh, um, true ecologists hate the word industrial ecology, but what, what they mean is how do industrial elements connect together, and and, and what works and and what are the systems involved. And so I'm giving some thought about what that will look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I appreciate about your message here, Dr. Michaud, is there's some real optimism and there's some very practical solutions. And I yeah. think that we should have another conversation and focus on solutions. 
um, so, uh, ideas so, so, that you have, because it sounds to me, you're definitely thinking outside the box. You're very creative. You're very intelligent. And we need leadership like yours to go forward. So I work with the, the idea of that I'm a gateway between one world and another. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so that, that's that's what I'm trying to do here. So we must look at all the nasty stuff, work out which parts of it are illusion. Mm -hmm. Right. And then decide who are we really and then make it true. Well, Dr. Simon Michaud, thank you so much for being with me today, all the way from Helsinki in Norway or Finland, sorry. Finland. Um, and thank you so much. I, I understand you're somewhere very remote today and that's part of the problem <laughs> that we yeah. can't see you. Uh, but thank you so much for, for your time and your insight today. And I look forward to chatting with you again. Okay. Okay. And you didn't know this, but there was a squirrel running up and down the tree behind <laughs> you out the window. <laughs> we have a bird feeder that the squirrels adore. So, yeah, I bet. I yeah. bet they do. Okay, thank you.